A very good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Truth for the Final Generation Adventist Congregation Zoom Sunday evening service. Welcome all of you to this Zoom meeting. Wherever you are, God bless you. Warmest greetings and welcome. We're looking at central themes of the Lord Christ, the gospel and the character of God, and we are focusing and have been focusing the last few Sunday evenings on the infinite love exhibited and revealed and demonstrated by the Father and the Son in the infinite sacrifice made to redeem us from every dimension of the sin problem, from the Adamic condemnation and the instant annihilation that hung over our heads from our own sins and from any condemnation at all straight onto eternal life. What love, as we looked at what Jesus endured for the last two weeks, we got a glimpse of and a greater appreciation of his love, the love of the Father and the Son for us. So we're going to go a little bit further now and make some applications to ourselves in terms of salvation. So I want to welcome everyone again. As we are about to start, we're going to pray and then proceed. Welcome one, welcome all, wherever you are that have joined us. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we are about now in the name of Jesus to pray to you and to go into our study, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us into deeper truth of your love and the plan of salvation and the infinite sacrifice made by you and your Son through the eternal Spirit for us. Open the eyes of our understanding. Above all, we pray that that same love will be given to us to motivate us to surrender all to you and to serve you from really and truly no other motive than that divine love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome again. Uh, I'm going to start with a little quotation before we go into the scriptures and look at some passages. Uh, this is one we ended with last time, uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 207. Nothing could have induced Christ to leave his honor and majesty in heaven and to come to a sinful world to be neglected, despised, and rejected by those he came to save. And finally, to suffer upon the cross. Nothing but eternal redeeming love, which will ever remain a mystery. So eternal redeeming love was the motivation that moved the Father and the Son to have done what they did for us. And that love will ever remain a mystery. And we want to apply that love to ourselves now because we will learn and revise some important points concerning that love. So I have a number of texts here. I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles and read, uh, and then we will get moving. The first one I would like someone to read for me, for us all, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, uh, from the King James Version. And then we will read it from a, a modern translation. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Someone read that for us, please. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and verse 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we have to 
study this text more deeply than superficially to understand what the Word of God is telling us. For example, let me read it here from the NIV, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, the New International Version. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. That's the great work of substitution and surety for us. And he died for all, watch it now, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Whoa. Second Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, NIV. For Christ's love compels us. That's what the King James Version means by the love of Christ constrains us. An old English word, old English application. Doesn't mean that love of Christ is holding us back. That is the old English term for compelling, motivating, driving. The love of Christ compels us because we are thus convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What a wonderful scripture. And it begins to transition our application, having seen the love of Christ, to now apply that love to us in our response to his salvation. Praise the Lord. Let someone read for me now Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians 5, 6. As we lay a foundation and get warmed up. Galatians 5, 6. Someone read that for us as well. Galatians 5, 6. For in, Christ, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Amen. The only thing that matters, the only thing that works, is faith working by love. Listen to it now from the NIV, Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith working by love. The only thing that counts is faith working by love, expressing itself through love. That is why the Laodicea message, when Jesus offers us the gold in Revelation chapter 3, the gold is faith and love, faith working by love, for faith working through love. That's the gold we need to be delivered from Laodicean lukewarmness, which is our doing religious duties, all from a self-centered motive, and think so highly of ourselves when we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and need the gold, which is the faith that works by love, and which banishes all self. So we're beginning to uh, get moving. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value, but faith expressing itself through love. Praise the Lord. Wonderful indeed. Faith expressing itself through love. We are going to go then next text to Romans 13, 8 to 10. Romans 13, 8 to 10, 8, 9, and 10. Another believer reading for us. Romans 13, 8, 9, and 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, 
it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Praise the Lord. Thank you again. The NIV says, Romans 13, 8 to 10, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, or whatsoever other command there may be are summed up in this one command love your neighbor as yourself love does no harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law paul was addressing human to human interactions here if we are addressing our relationship to god we would say the same thing we are love god with all our heart and soul and might and strength for loving god is the fulfilling of the first four commandments of the law, which describe our duty to God, just as the last six are fulfilled by our loving our neighbor, the first four are fulfilled by our loving God. And we can't love our neighbor and fulfill those last six towards our neighbor unless we love God and fulfill the first four towards him. Very important. You know there are some people who take this passage to mean and to say that therefore the first four commandments, including the Sabbath, are not relevant and these are the only commandments to be kept. I heard a man arguing that absurdity, quoting this passage to prove that we don't have to keep a Sabbath. When Paul was dealing with, in Romans 13, our relation to civility and human, other human beings, and stressing this point, and they used what he was stressing to cancel what he was not dealing with at this particular point in time. The things people will do to get away from truth. But love to God, love to our fellow man, is the fulfilling of the law and we can only have any love to our fellow man when we have the love of god which is expressed towards god vertically and then horizontally towards our fellow human beings praise the lord and uh somebody else there are, lot, there are quite a few people here and only a few people volunteer to read uh thank you sister phillips for reading for us first corinthians 13 1 to 3 before we get to the other parts of it Someone else read that for us, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Thank you very much. Whoa. Notice the things we can do without love. Notice the things that we can do without love, and they profit and count as nothing. The NIV says, 1 Corinthians 13, I like how it is put here. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of an angel, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith, a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. So faith must work through love. Otherwise, that faith is a counterfeit, even if it moves mountains. Amazing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the flames or to any adversity, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Whoa. Hope you're following these texts, these foundation texts. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. Galatians 5, 6. 
Romans 13, 8 to 10, and now 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. These foundation texts we are laying here from the Word of God. Now someone read for me Romans 6, 17. Romans 6, 17. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Praise the Lord. God be thankful. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Notice that, obeyed from the heart. That is another expression meaning that we are motivated by the love of God to obey from the heart. Having laid those foundation texts, let us move on a little bit now. Uh, we are told in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 1, 3, 5, love is power. So you know sometimes we talk about God's power being greater than Satan's power. All Christians say that, and most Christians mean they, when they say that, they're talking about raw power in terms of God's infinite power and Satan, Satan's uh, power can't compare with God. Now, the great controversy is not over who has the greater power. Satan knows that God's power is infinite. The great controversy is talking about a different power than the power of physics and mechanics and energy. It is talking about the power of love. So when we say God's greater is he that is within us than he that is uh, against us, we are talking about the love of God motivating us to overcome all sin. We are not talking about raw physical power of one against the other because that is not in contention in the great controversy. And these fine points in the character of God we need to understand because we ourselves sometimes slip into these issues on the character where we should have it very straight. The issues in the great controversy is not over have the greater power between God and Satan. That was never an issue. It is over how the universe is run and God is claiming to run it on the principles of love and freedom and Satan is saying it can't be run that way. Force and some degree of self-defense and self-exaltation or all the degree would be necessary. And Satan's way of running the universe, which is the way of selfishness, compared to God's way of running the universe, which is the way of self-sacrificing, unselfish love, those are the issues in contention. And God will win, not by having superior uh, physical power over the enemy, but by allowing love to show that it will win against selfishness without any coercive measures on the part of God. Whereas Satan is always seeking to use coercion to force those who don't agree with him or kill them, as will happen, as has happened down through history, and as will happen again in the Great Controversy. Important point. So, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 135, Love is Power. Intellectual and moral strength are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it. Love cannot live without action, and every act increases, strengthens, and extends it. Love will gain the victory. Love will gain the victory. And uh, Christ's object lesson, speaking about the love of God, expressed and revealed through Jesus Christ, this love masters every motive, masters every other motive, and raises its possessor above the corrupting influence of this world. This love, the love of God, masters every other motive, will conquer every other motive, and raise its possessor above the corrupting influence of the world. Wow. That was our Christ Object Lessons 101. Uh, the love of Christ in the heart is what is needed. This is now Esther Bible Commentary, Volume 6, 1100 to 1101. The love of Christ in the heart is what is needed. Self is in need of being crucified. Ah, so we now see what is meant by 
unselfish, self-sacrificing love. Jesus emptied himself, gave her all, did not count himself at all in the reckoning. He was willing, whatever it took, to save us. Even if it took him being separated from the Father forever, he was willing to take that stand. This is, this is love. This is the love of God. So Jesus was not looking for any reward or fearing any consequences. It is just love that he reckoned with and love for a wretch like me that led him to make that infinite sacrifice. So the love of Christ in the heart is what is needed. Self is in need of being crucified. So Paul in Galatians 2.20, someone repeat that for me. I am crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. So, our selfishness no longer is to be allowed to control our thinking and our characters. The unselfish love of God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit is to be the new motive power. Not I, but Christ. Not selfishness, but the love of God as shown and as revealed and demonstrated before the universe in Jesus Christ. When self is submerged in Christ, true love springs forth spontaneously. Whoa. It is not an emotion or an impulse, the love of God, but a decision of a sanctified will. It consists not in feeling, but in the transformation of the whole heart, soul, and character, which is dead to self and alive unto God. Our Lord and Savior asks us to give ourselves to him. Surrendering self to God is all he requires. Surrendering self to God is all he requires. Giving ourselves to him to be employed as he sees fit. Until we come to this point of surrender, we shall not work happily, usefully, or successfully anywhere we might be. Wow. Notice the importance of the love of God that motivated Father and Son to save us, and that same love of God that motivated the Father and Son through the eternal spirit to save us must motivate us to love God, love our fellow human beings, surrender to God, and love God back, and above all the odds, obey him from that motivation. So it is important to realize then that the righteousness of Christ does not consist of merely right actions and good works, listen carefully, but rather the righteousness of Christ consists in right actions and good works from pure, unselfish motives. We hear in Herald, volume 2, page 53. Repeat that. The righteousness of Christ does not consist of merely right actions and good works, but rather the righteousness of Christ consists in right actions and good works from pure, unselfish motives, the love of God, banishing self and controlling the heart. Nothing could have induced Christ to humble himself and pass through the horrors of Calvary, the horrors of eternity eternal death, but eternal redeeming love. Likewise, our responding obedience must proceed from a heart filled with love for him. We love him because he first loved us. We must have his love in order to love him and love our fellow human beings. Otherwise, we are dealing with feeling, impulse, but we are talking here about the love of God. And any obedience Lacking this motivation, lacking this motive force of love is neither true nor acceptable to God. Wow. Desire of Vigil says all true obedience comes from the heart. 
as Rabbi said, coming from the heart, we, we are talking therefore about the motivation of divine love. It was hard work with Christ. So all that Christ did for us, his sinless life of perfect obedience, overcoming every satanic temptation, trial, and strategy, was motivated by love. His bearing the cross and the agonies of Gethsemane and suffering the agonies of complete separation from his father and making up his mind through that fearful struggle to save us at any cost to himself, that was the motivation of divine love. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. So he said, Lord, have mercy upon me. And please enable me to let your love identify with my thoughts and aims. So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. This is now when the love of God has taken complete possession and control of our will, intellect, and emotions, and emotions we refer to as heart, so that the love is such that when obeying God, we are carrying out our own impulses because we love him and want to do nothing else but serve him, irrespective of the pressure from the world, the flesh, or the devil. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. Where we know God is, it is our privilege to know him and he has revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory, the character of God, shines in the face of Jesus Christ and shone with particular brilliance at Calvary so that we know God to be the God of completely unselfish, self-sacrificing, all for the other, none for self-love. And through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us because of the love of God. Wow. So these are thoughts that lead, cause me to definitely do a lot of heart searching and agonizing prayer for forgiveness and cleansing and the death of self and for the love of God to come in. And then to one that we know, these are pages 480 that will sit, 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 all true obedience comes from the heart. Now 480. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward. I heard a preacher the other day, I'm not criticizing the preacher, saying, I want to save your soul from hell. That is why you're here. God meets us where we are. When we first come, we want we, we still have self-centered motives. We want to be saved from hell, and we want the reward of heaven. And God meets us there and tells us, no problem. When I'm finished with you, neither of those two considerations will be your motivation. Well, well, well. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him, now, understand that when the disciples of Christ, any disciples, those back there and we first come, we come with fear of punishment and deserve for reward. Let's be honest. But by the time he's finished with us, this is, what we, this is what must happen. They behold the Savior's matchless love revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of him attracts softens, subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice and they follow him. Praise the Lord. Love. And then last week I mentioned something that uh, apparently some people were not aware of. One person asked me about it. I cleared it up and that person asked me to go over it again because some people might have the same question uh, that person had. I mentioned the experience of Enoch. In the experience of Enoch, we find a perfect example of love actuated motivation to obey the Lord. Uh, remember what I said last time? Well, in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 55, we have this statement. Enoch was troubled in regard to the... Now listen, Enoch walked with God for how many years? Somebody unmute their mic and tell me how long Enoch walked with God. 300. 
300. All right. Now, you not lived uh, that length of time. We, we don't live that anywhere near that long. Okay, we live a few years, and we find it difficult to walk with God for a few years. When things happen, we uh, may be driven by fear and urgency. If things settle back down, we ease back off. And he not walked with God for 300 years without a certain understanding. Listen, he not was troubled in regard to the dead. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 355. It seemed to him that the righteous and the wicked would go to the dust together, and that would be their end. He could not clearly see the life of the just beyond the grave. Pause. So Enoch walked with God for 300 years without the understanding we have at first about final reward. So God gave him this vision then towards the end. In prophetic vision, he was instructed in regard to the Son of God who was the die man's sacrifice and was shown the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven attended by the angelic host to give life to the righteous dead and ransom them from their graves. Now, watch it. He not served God with a perfect heart, practiced self-denial and lived the life of perfect obedience to God's will. He placed God and his holiness first in his life as very few others have. And yet while he traveled that narrow way for 300 years, he had no knowledge of his sure reward of eternal life in God's kingdom until the vision was given him, showing him the final events that are recorded in the book of Jude. And imagine serving God for 300 years without the knowledge of final reward. That is an example of being motivated by love and not knowing anything or having a reward up ahead of you. This is an example. Whoa. This is an example. So most all of us start out with the fear of being lost and the love of being saved in the eternal kingdom. Nothing wrong with that. But God has to bring us, especially the translation bound remnant, like Enoch was translated, have to reach the point where those considerations fade in significance compared to the pure motivation of the love of God. So that this is where we now have to examine, this is where we have to examine our hearts. I have to examine my heart. Suppose there was no hell to shun and no heavenly reward to get. And we had the issues of God's way and Satan's way before us. Would we still choose to serve God as he not did? Or would we join the others just before the flood and say, eat and drink? For tomorrow we die, and there is nothing more to happen. Well, what a heart-searching question for me. I have can to dig up my insides. Can Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm glad that you are emphasizing the fact that God meets us where we are. And when we first come, we don't always even know our own hearts. So. Oftentimes we come, as you said, for selfish reasons. Yes. Um, and I'm making this point to say that there are times when, well, we want to encourage people to, well, participate in God's service. They may not always have the right motivations, but we can't wait for that. Neither are we to judge them. Yes. But we are to encourage them nevertheless to do what they can in participating because I remember the story there of Saul who was to be king when he wasn't tr converted, but as he went up by Saul, by Samuel, as he was participating and prophesying and speaking and so on, we are told that God gave him a new heart while doing that. So that, um, while we are doing these things, while we are participating, while we are having our heart searches, we are to keep on so that God will bring us around even while doing his service. 
carrying us from one level to the next. Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, Sister Flo. So what a wonderful character God has. He meets us where we are. And as we do what we are doing, even from motives that are less than ideal, he so reveals his love and works with us that we are going to graduate from that level to higher levels. In other words, what does the text say? Uh, we, we, are tra we are changed into the same glory from faith to faith. So the faith keeps us, as the floor mentioned, it mentioned, God meets us where we are and carries us forward from faith to faith until our, until our faith is rooted entirely in his love. And that is the position, especially for us uh, in this time and heading forwards and towards the final crisis, because we will have to go through such things as that, like Jesus, not seeing through the the portals of the tomb, but having to depend on his father's love and act uh, in that love to save a wretch like me, we are going to have eventually to reach that point. But well, point, point well made. He meets us where we are. And so we are to encourage each other, wherever we are, to do our best, and God will carry us forward from faith to faith until we reach the point that he wants us to reach. Thank you for that. Someone else is making a point? Okay, continuing now. We have this uh, passage from Steps to Christ. I think we're all familiar with it, 44 to 46. Listen to it now. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character, and to secure salvation. Notice this. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of God. So at whatever stage we are, knowing the amount of love we feel at that stage is still to be our motivation as we grow on and grow on and grow on, dying deeper deaths to self. So there are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Now this brings us to another point. Those of us who are in the third angel's message for a long enough time to have come to know more about the love of Christ, but are not, and are still therefore in this position, and this is the position that the Adventist world was in when God sent that most precious message in 1888. He sought to turn their attention to Christ and his matchless charms and unfailing love so that they would have a new motivation for surrendering all and serving him. When they would see what he has done for all men out of a pure love, then they would change from doing what they, all that they were doing after being so long in the truth, not even as newborn babes, but knocking around. That's the one position. And God wanted to turn their attention to the matchless terms of the love of, of Christ. Because the Laodicean religion means that we would have had enough time to be seeing the love of God and to be motivated by that love, but still we are occupied with self-centered motivation. And such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Wow. So when we have to plead with ourselves or with each other to pray, that is all right. Because in the act of praying, God will continue to work for us. But we, we, we are... We are being told here we, we are going to reach this point, and we have to understand that we must reach it and understand the importance 
of reaching it and this modus operandi of seeing the love of God, seeing that love revealed at Calvary and being motivated by that love to pray, to commune with God and to share that love and above all, that all we do will be motivated by that love. Those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standard, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. Whoa. So when we are troubled by certain standards and we want to have our own standards and whatever the area is, dress reform, health reform, it means we need to have God raise us to the point where love is our motivation and nothing is too hard to give up, motivated by that love, when we see that Jesus Christ gave up all heaven to die for a wretch like me. With earnest desire, they yield all and manifest an earn interest proportionate to the value of the object they seek. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. Wow. Do you feel that it is too great a sacrifice to yield all to Christ? Ask yourself the question, what has Christ given for me? The Son of God gave all, life, love, suffering for our redemption. And can it be that we, the unworthy objects of so great love, will withhold our hearts from him? Every moment of our lives, we have been partakers of the blessings of his grace. And for this very reason, that we are partakers of the blessings of his grace, we cannot fully realize the depths of ignorance and misery from which we have been saved. You get that point? Because of his mercy, we don't, ever, we don't even realize how wretched we have been and from what position we have been saved. Wow. Can we look upon him whom our sins have pierced and yet be willing? to do despite to all his love and sacrifice, in view of the infinite humiliation of the Lord of glory, shall we murmur because we can enter into life only through conflict and self-abasement? All this is steps to Christ 44 to 46. But what do we give up when we give all? A sin-polluted heart for Jesus to purify, to cleanse by his own blood, to save by his matchless love. And yet, and yet men think it hard to give up all. I am ashamed to hear of it, to hear it spoken, ashamed to write it. And what a statement to the Laodicean lukewarm condition. Hence, Jesus says, you need to buy of me the gold. The gold is my faith that work by love. And I have to do all I did for you, said Jesus, by that love. And you will have to do all you do in serving me from that love for it to mean anything to me. Just as if I had done anything without love, it would have meant nothing to you. So we see now the centrality of the love of God, revealing the character of God in the gospel as the light that will lighten the, world, the earth with its glory, revealing a God who doesn't use any raw physical force, but only the power of love. And therefore, any church, state union to enforce religion right away, whether it is enforcing something right or wrong, is wrong. And this is the kind of light that will lighten people who may be still wavering about Saturday, Sabbath, uh, Sunday issues, but when they hear of the love of God and the character of God, and therefore seeing powers seeking to enforce a particular day, all of a sudden that love of God will crystallize in their minds. That system cannot be right. And then after that, they can see everything else. So the light that lightens the earth with the glory of God, the true gospel revealing his love and his character and the principles of freedom and no coercion, only love, will indeed bring the world to decision. It must bring us first the decision to be cleansed of all lukewarmness, of all self in our religious experience, thinking that we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and we are doing so much and everything, when self is back there, but being emptied of self and being filled only with the goal, which is faith expressing itself through love, as we read earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15, from the New International Version, which I will read uh, 
to the end again. So uh, these things mean to me that I have to undergo such close self-examination day by day, such agonizing prayer, because this is the love of God that must be the motivation. Thank God for meeting me where I am, as Sister Flo mentioned, but he wants to carry us on to where we must be at, up ahead for the final crisis. Any comments or sharing at this stage before we proceed? Thank God for his love. Any points to share? Any questions? Back to the Enoch position. Uh, so Enoch, you know, we, we are just down here for uh, 70, 80. Some may reach 100. Some drop off earlier. And uh, we have the knowledge of the second coming and the reward and so on. Enoch, in that long-lived race, served God for 300 years. Well, I wonder if we knew that the end wasn't going to come for another 100 years, how we would be now. You know, we, 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 we get all worked up, for example, in a pandemic. Uh, like people were worked up in the 1918 pandemic or World War I or World War II. And uh, I'm not saying we're not to read the signs of the times, but even beyond all of that, God is still waiting for that faith that works by love to be the true motivation and not even the signs of the time. Signs of the time may meet us where we are to jerk us out of our complacency, to seek the love of God to be our true motivation. But the true love of God must ultimately be our true motivation. 300 years, he not walked with God without any clear understanding at first of final rewards until he received that vision. And still, he served God out of a pure heart of love because he caught a glimpse of God and God's love and loved him back. So Enoch's life is a tremendous rebuke to me. It causes me to search my heart, not with a candle, but with a fairly hot flame to burn the cell that sees it. Oh Lord, have mercy on my soul. What an example there. Whoa. So, we have to examine ourselves and due to the fact that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 79. My heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Paul admonished us to examine ourselves and to see whether we are truly in the faith or not as the self. Self is deceitful. That is why self must be crucified and we must have the new man, Christ Jesus, the love of God, which is pure and empties us of the deceitfulness of self by emptying us of self, because self is always deceitful, hence it must be crucified. And there is to be, there is, there is no more searching thought than to consider what our course of life would be if there was no eternity awaiting us as a reward of faithfulness. That's a searching thought. If there was no reward, would I still serve God? If there were no heaven and no eternal life, I truly wonder how many of us, how I, who claim to love Christ, would bear his cross, though there be no crown. So we have to now see where this love of God cut straight at us. Jesus gave up all. And though he could not see through the portals of the tomb, he stood on that love and made the decision to save us at any cost to himself. And now seeing that love, we are brought to the same point of decision. Are we willing to serve him because we love him at whatever cost to ourselves, without any consideration of reward or fear of punishment? Though God meets us where we are when we start out with those concerns, and he's such a wonderful God, he carries us faithfully on. So that's why we, we started out by saying the Apostle Paul says, uh, in the service of God, you know, uh, it is possible to do the right things for the wrong reason. Though I speak 
the truth with the eloquence of men and of angels. Though I bestow all my goods to feed and clothe the poor, though I give my bodies to the flames as a martyr and have not the love of Christ as the motivating force of my actions, it shall profit me nothing. And God has been waiting long for us to be delivered from the war mess, which is a self-works oriented program by the true gospel revealing the true love of God. So we receive the gold. I counsel thee to buy of me gold. The gold is the faith and love of Jesus, his faith working through his love, the love of God to achieve our redemption and giving, us, giving it to us as a free gift. And that same love is to motivate us now to be emptied of self, not to focus on self or our performance, but to focus on him, see his matchless charms and be captivated by his love. What a God, what love, what salvation. So deliverance from lukewarmness. And only those who are delivered from lukewarmness will qualify for the latter rain. So we begin to see now that the latter rain is such an understanding and experience of the love of God that all motivation of self is banished and we are filled more and more with the love of God, which, is, which means we are filled more and more with the Spirit of God. We are growing and ripening in that love of God. And we talk about the latter rain being poured out and that, that, that language has its place but it is really a growing into Lateran proportions as we see the love of God more and more and surrender more and more in the circuit of beneficence, that love in the Holy Spirit as it motivates and causes us to go. It motivates and causes us to go. We are being transformed from faith to faith and from love to love by that same glory. Praise the Lord. Yes. We are told that at every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yes. Yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. That's right. And and read it and say, go ahead. Right. So, you know, a little child love, his, love the parents at age one and trust parents at age one, at age six months. As the child grows and it understands more, that love and trust takes on deeper appreciations. At every stage of growth, we can be perfect for that stage, but there is still all the way to go until we reach maturity of faith and love and character. So love, the Lord. love is the foundation of every stage. That's right. That's right. So when we look now at, as we shall look next time, please God, at struggles with defects, overcoming defects, souls being emptied of defilement, emptied of self, which is the reaching the stage of the air. We will see now how this love will drive, motivate us, and then how our effort becomes the effort of dying to self so that love motivates us to make obedience easy in inverted commas. As Brother Saul said the other day, easier to be saved than loss. When we see that love of God and understand what he's done for us and are motivated. Uh, when Huss was taken to the stake to be burnt, the cardinals were amazed that Huss was saying a hymn while they were saying loathsome remarks about him. And the faith and love a martyr needs is not bestowed until it is needed. Has couldn't, couldn't believe before that that he could go to the state and sing, but he kept surrendered and he was being changed from love to love and from faith to faith as he beheld the glory. So sometimes we think about the final crisis and we wonder, whoa, fines, imprisonment, can't by ourselves, running and hiding, police chasing us down, 
ultimately the death sentence? Can we bear it? How starts that question, Jerome? Jesus said, Lord, is it possible that this cup can pass? But love conquered and love will conquer. Our task is to see this love, appreciate it, and receive it and grow in it to where God will take us as we trust him and love him and trust and love keeps growing. May we pray for each other. May Lord, the Lord have mercy upon me and upon us all as we contemplate that love and where it will take us in Jesus Christ. Margaret has her hand up, though. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Honorable Sister. Hi, good evening. Good evening. No, I, I, what you're saying, I, I, I'm totally in agreement with because I believe that um, the joys of heaven and, uh, you know, we don't want to go to hell. And if those things are our motivators, then it, I mean, it profits us nothing. It's only the love of God that will eventually save us. And I believe that, and I, I say this all the time, that God is coming for people who are in love with him and in love with each other. So my question then is, I believe that that love ought to be central in our messages. Um, the entire Bible is important, but I believe that that message of love is an entire message and should be central in all of our messages. How can we present revelation so that we are not just seeing the beasts and dragons and, and, and all the other most of animals that we see in Revelation. How can we present like Revelation so that we can see God's love um, supremely and we don't see the terror of the end. We don't see all the troubles and so on, but we can actually see God's love and then we are motivated to even love him more. And then it even positions us that we can get through the time of crisis. Well, the answer is, as I said yesterday, anytime prophecy is separated from the gospel of Jesus Christ and the testimony of Jesus Christ and God as creator and his character, it becomes a private interpretation. So we, we must keep Christ in the center of our prophetic understanding. And though we have to describe the details of what will happen, we have to uh, interpret it all in the character of God and in, in the love of God as we go. Christ must be the center of prophecy. Christ must be the center of every doctrine and teaching. Christ and his love must be central in all of our teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is it coming up to six o'clock? So I think we should have a season of prayer. Let's have a season of silent, uh, uh, coming up to seven o'clock, sorry. Let's have a season of silent prayer before we close off, praying that God will indeed give us deeper glimpses of this love and open our hearts to receive it and to be transformed by it moment by moment, day by day, and to be therefore equipped to teach it and to live it and to be ripened by it for the final events. A season of silent prayer before we close.
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege of having shared on your love in our Sunday evening service. We thank you for such love. You so love the world that you gave your son and that love that motivated you to give. We pray that that love will motivate us to surrender all. We thank you for the gold tried in the fire of faith, working by love of Jesus Christ. We need that gold, empty us of self. May we truly experience Paul's statement, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, not self, but Christ liveth in me, so that his self-sacrificing love will be our motivation and not the I, the self. Deliver us from lukewarmness, deliver us from self, and may we truly get deeper glimpses of your love by studying your word and praying to you. Have mercy upon us, bless all of our members, all of our believers here and abroad, all of your people wherever they are, because your people are one in Christ. Be merciful to us. Give us a week of victory in Jesus' name we pray. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good night. God bless you all. Keep praying and trusting.